Living matter, while not eluding the laws of physics as established up to date, is likely to involve other laws of physics, hitherto unknown. Life seems to be orderly and lawful behaviour of matter, not based exclusively on its tendency to go over from order to disorder, but based partly on existing order that is kept up. In biology, we are faced with an entirely different situation. A single group of atoms existing only in one copy produces orderly events, marvelously tuned in with each other and with the environment according to most subtle laws. In the following stages of a higher organism, the copies are multiplied. Since we know the power this tiny central office has in the isolated cell, do they not resemble stations of local government dispersed through the body, communicating with each other with great ease, thanks to the code that is common to all of them? Well, this is a fantastic description perhaps less becoming a scientist than a poet. However, it needs no poetical imagination, but only clear and sober scientific reflection to recognize that we are here obviously faced with events whose regular and lawful unfolding is guided by a mechanism entirely different from the probability mechanism of physics. Whether we find it astonishing or or whether we find it quite plausible that a small but highly organized group of atoms be capable of acting in this manner, the situation is unprecedented. It is unknown anywhere else except in living matter. According to the evidence put forward in the preceding pages, the space-time events in the body of a living being which correspond to the activity of its mind, to its self-conscious or any other actions, are, if not strictly deterministic, at any rate statistical deterministic. To the physicist I wish to emphasize that in my opinion, and contrary to the opinion upheld in some quarters, quantum indeterminacy plays no biologically relevant role in them. For the sake of the argument, let me regard this as a fact, as I believe every unbiased biologist would, if there were not the well-known, unpleasant feeling about declaring oneself to be a pure mechanism. For it is deemed to contradict free will, as warranted by direct introspection. So, let us see whether we can draw the correct, non-contradictory conclusion from the following two premises. One. My body functions as a pure mechanism according to the laws of nature. 2. Yet I know, by incontrovertible direct experience, that I am directing its motions, of which I foresee the effects, that may be faithful and all-important, in which case I feel and take full responsibility for them. The only possible inference from these two facts, I think, is that I, I in the widest meaning of the word, that is to say every conscious mind that has ever said or felt I, am the person, if any, who controls the motion of the atoms according to the laws of nature. Hence I am God Almighty, sounds both blasphemous and lunatic. But please disregard these connotations for the moment and consider whether the above inference is not the closest a biologist can get to proving God and immortality at one stroke. In itself, the insight is not new. The earliest records to my knowledge date back some 2,500 years or more. From the, from the early great Upanishads, the recognition Atman equals Brahman the personal self equals the omnipresent, all-comprehending eternal self, was in Indian thought considered, far from being blasphemous, to represent the quintessence of deepest insight into the happenings of the world. The striving of all the scholars of Vedanta was, after having learned to pronounce with their lips, really to assimilate in their minds this grandest of all thoughts. Again, the mystics of many centuries, independently, yet in perfect harmony with each other, somewhat like the particles of an ideal gas, have described, each of them, 
the unique experience of his or her life in terms that can be condensed in the phrase Deus factus sum, I have become God. To Western ideology, the thought has remained a stranger. In spite of Schopenhauer and others who stood for it, and in spite of those true lovers who, as they look into each other's eyes, become aware that their thought and their joy are numerically one. Consciousness is never experienced in the plural, only in the singular. How does the idea of plurality, so emphatically opposed by the Upanishad writers, arise at all? Consciousness finds itself intimately connected with and dependent on the physical state of a limited region of matter, the body. Now, there is a great plurality of similar bodies, hence the pluralization of consciousness or minds seems a very suggestive hypothesis. It leads almost immediately to the invention of souls, as many as there are bodies, and to the question whether they are mortal as the body is or whether they are immortal and capable of existing by themselves. The former alternative is distasteful, while the latter frankly forgets, ignores or disowns the facts upon which the plurality hypothesis rests. Such consequences, even if only tentative, must make us suspicious of the plurality hypothesis, which is common to all official Western creeds. Are we not inclining to much greater nonsense if in discarding their gross superstitions we retain their naive idea of plurality of souls, but remedy it by declaring the souls to be perishable, to be annihilated with the respective bodies? The only possible alternative is simply to keep to the immediate experience that consciousness is a singular of which the plural is unknown, that there is only one thing and that what seems to be plurality is merely a series of different aspects of this one thing, produced by a deception, the Indian Maya. The same illusion is produced in a gallery of mirrors, and in the same way Garrison Kerr and Mount Everest turned out to be the same peak seen from different valleys. Yet each of us has the indisputable impression that the sum total of his own experience and memory forms a unit, quite distinct from that of any other person. He refers to it as I. What is this I? If you analyse it closely, you will, I think, find that it is just a little bit more than a collection of single data, experiences and memories, namely the canvas upon which they are collected. And you will, on close introspection, find that what you really mean by I is that ground stuff upon which they are collected. The point of view taken here levels with what Aldous Huxley has recently and very appropriately called the perennial philosophy. His beautiful book is singularly fit to explain not only the state of affairs, but also why it is so difficult to grasp and so liable to meet with opposition. The principle of objectivation. By this I mean the thing that is also frequently called the hypothesis of the real world around us. I maintain that it amounts to a certain simplification which we adopt in order to master the infinitely intricate problem of nature. Without being aware of it and without being rigorously systematic about it, we exclude the subject of cognitance from the domain of nature that we endeavour to understand. We step with our own person back into the part of an onlooker who does not belong to the world which by this very procedure becomes an objective world. This device is veiled by the following two circumstances. First, my own body, to which my mental activity is so very directly and intimately linked, forms part of the object, the real world around me, that I construct out of my sensations, perceptions and memories. Secondly, the bodies of other people form part of this objective world, now, I have very good reasons for believing that these other bodies are also linked up with, or are, as it were, the seeds of spheres of consciousness. 
I can have no reasonable doubt about the existence or some kind of actualness of these foreign spheres of consciousness. Yet I have absolutely no direct subjective access to any of them. Hence I am inclined to take them as something objective, as forming part of the real world around me. Moreover, since there is no distinction between myself and others, but on the contrary, full symmetry for all intents and purposes, I conclude that I myself also form part of this real material world around me. I, so to speak, put my own sentient self, which had constructed this world as a mental product, back into it, with a pandemonium of disastrous logical consequences that flow from the aforesaid chain of faulty conclusions. A moderately satisfying picture of the world has only been reached at the high price of taking ourselves out of the picture, stepping back into the role of, non -concerned of a non-concerned observer. The first of these antinomies is the astonishment at finding our world picture colourless, cold, mute. Colour and sound, hot and cold, are our immediate sensations small wonder that they are lacking in a world model from which we have removed our own mental person. The second is our fruitless quest for the place where mind acts on matter and vice versa. The material world has only been constructed at the price of taking the self, that is, mind, out of it, removing it. Mind is not part of it, obviously therefore we can neither act on it nor be acted on by any of its parts. This was stated in a very brief and clear sentence by Spinoza. The reason why our sentient, recipient and thinking ego is met nowhere within our scientific world picture can easily be indicated in seven words. Because it is itself that world picture. It is identical with the whole and therefore cannot be contained in it as a part of it. But of course, here we knock against the arithmetical paradox. There appears to be a great multitude of these conscious egos. The world, however, is only one. This comes from the fashion in which the world concept produces itself. The several domains of private consciousness partly overlap. The region common to all where they all overlap is the construct of the real world around us. With all that, an uncomfortable feeling remains, prompting such questions as Is my world really the same as yours? Is there one real world to be distinguished from its pictures introjected by way of perception into every one of us? And if so, are these pictures like unto real world, or is the latter, the world in itself, perhaps very different from the one we perceive? There are two ways out of the number paradox, both appearing rather lunatic from the point of view of present scientific thought, based on ancient Greek thought and thus thoroughly Western. One way out is the multiplication of the world in Leibniz's fearful doctrine of monads. Every monad to be a world by itself, no communication between them, the monad has no windows, it is incommunicado. That nonetheless they all agree with each other is called pre-established harmony. I think there are few to whom this suggestion appeals, nay who would consider it as a mitigation at all of the numerical antinomy. There is obviously only one alternative, namely the unification of minds or consciousness. Their multiplicity is only apparent. In truth, there is only one mind. Ten years ago, Aldous Huxley published a precious volume which he called The Perennial Philosophy, and which is an anthology from the mystics of the most various periods and the most various people. Open it where you will, and you will find many beautiful utterances of a similar kind. You are struck by the miraculous agreement between humans of different race, different religion, knowing nothing about each other's existence, separated by centuries and millennia, and by the greatest distances that there are on our globe. Still, it must be said that to Western thought this doctrine has little appeal. It is unpalatable, it is the fantastic and scientific. Well, it is so because our science, Greek science, is based on objectivation, whereby it has cut itself off from an adequate understanding of the subject of cognitance, 
of the mind. But I do believe that this is precisely the point where our present way of thinking does need to be amended. Perhaps by a bit of blood transfusion from Eastern thought. That will not be easy. We must beware of blunders. Blood transfusion always needs great precaution to prevent clotting. We do not wish to lose the logical precision that our scientific thought has reached, and that is unparalleled anywhere at any epoch. Earlier I have commented on the fact that for this same reason the physical world picture lacks all the sensual qualities that go to make up the subject of cognitance. The model is colourless and soundless and impalpable. In the same way and for the same reason the world of science lacks, or is deprived of, everything that has a meaning only in relation to the consciously contemplating, perceiving and feeling subject. I mean in the first place the ethical and aesthetical values, any values of any kind, everything related to the meaning and scope of the whole display. All this is not only absent, but it cannot, from the purely scientific point of view, be inserted organically. If one tries to put it in or on, as a child puts colour on his uncoloured painting copies, it will not fit. For anything that is made to enter this world model willy-nilly takes the form of scientific assertion or facts, and as such it becomes wrong.